Hello, 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 and welcome. All of you invisible people, I can see you logging on out there and we're so thrilled to have such a great attendance even in this remote manner of meeting for the annual Morton Marcus poetry reading. So I'm gonna let some of you keep logging on. We'll start slow here while that happens. I can see the numbers going up. I feel like I'm running a game show when I say that. So <laughs> sorry, this is indeed going to be a poetry reading. So welcome, welcome everyone. And thank you so much for showing up from wherever you are. We're really glad to have you. We wish we were meeting in person, but we're grateful we get to do this over Zoom. So we're right there with you somehow in your living room um, while you're kicking back and having a cup of tea or however it is. So thank you for joining us. And this is the 12th annual Morton Marcus reading. So this has been going on for over a decade and has been such a wonderful event each year. And I'm really looking forward to hearing Gary Young read tonight. So a big treat in store for us. And somehow this tradition continues even during the pandemic. And I'm so glad that it does, as is our whole committee here. The chat has been disabled just to get to a little housekeeping to start out with. Um, so it's disabled this evening, but please feel free to enter your questions for Gary at any point during this event through the Q&A. And we'll get to as many of them as we can. And feel free to ask him anything, anything at all, <laughs> or almost anything. Um, you know, but preferably poetry related. But I don't know, just putting it out there. We love having questions at the end. And that gives us some time to share together as a community uh, where we can really be more directly uh, connected during this event. Oh, I should say my name is Danusha Lamaris, and I have been an eager attendee of many a Morton Marcus reading in years past, and I'm a big fan of Gary Young's work. So it is my honor to welcome you tonight. I want to say also a few words about our generous sponsors. So here I am referring a bit to my notes, but bear with me. This event would not be possible without the efforts of many individuals and the generous support of several institutions. I'd like to thank our sponsors beginning with our family properties here in Santa Cruz. And from UCSC, many thanks to the Humanities Institute who are hosting us in this format tonight, Special Collections and Archives, the Creative Writing Program, and the Living Writers Series, the Porter Hitchcock Poetry Fund, and Cowell College. Thanks as well to Poetry Santa Cruz, Cabrillo College English Department, Bookshop Santa Cruz, and Santa Cruz Writes. I would also like to salute the marvelous members of the Morton Marcus Poetry Reading Organizing Committee. So a mouthful, but it is a good thing to have so many people supporting this reading that honors the life's work of Morton Marcus and brings us together in this manner year after year and is part of Mort's legacy. So a bit about Mort. Morton Marcus was one of our country's premier poets. In addition to being a novelist, memoirist, film and literary critic, Mort taught at Cabrillo for 30 years and fostered an uncountable number of poets and writers who were inspired and mentored by him. In the early 70s, Mort established a poetry reading series which was the inspiration and driver for the burgeoning poetry scene that has continued to flourish here. And for those of you who may or may not know, Santa Cruz is indeed a poetry town, something I personally have benefited from living here, that it's just very alive in poetry and Mort's fingerprints are all over that um, aspect of Santa Cruz culture. He was the indisputable father of the poetry scene here. In addition to his writing, his teaching and his community organizing, Mort hosted the poetry show on our local community radio station, as well as a popular television program. 
Mort received a Gail Rich Award and was honored as a Santa Cruz County Artist of the Year. Morton's archive is held in the Special Collections Library at UCSC, and I encourage you to check those out, including recordings of these um, annual readings. Gary Young has described Mort, his dear friend, as a passionate advocate for poetry, a gourmand, a generous and steadfast friend, a fabulous raconteur, and an indefatigable spirit who left an enormous mark on the literary landscape and on our local community, one that continues to resonate. It is our tradition to kick off this reading with the reading of one of Mort's poems. And I had the pleasure of leafing through uh, some of his books trying to decide which one I would read. And I found a poem that I know is going to be uh, homed in my favorite poem binder, which I keep here um, in my writing desk. Just, um, and it's called What is Alive in Us? And I think this poem speaks to something that is very hard to put into words, which is what we hope poems will do. And I think this one does it. And it's, again called this alive in us what is alive in us what vibrates in our animal skins is a harp string that is never still a harp string tuned to the drone of silence it is the single thread the radiant filament that sews us to our coat of darkness the umbilical that holds us to the planet each of us is, yet allows us to wander among the stars, the guy rope that secures us to ourselves, yet lets us venture into the darkness all the way to the planet of someone else. I love that ending so much. I love everything about it, but tuned to the drone of silence. I think when poems are doing their best work, they attune us to that silence more deeply than we were before we read the poem. So thank you again for being here with us. And if you're just joining us, thank you for doing so. And we're so excited to be here for the 12th year in a row, pandemic and all, enjoying the annual Morton Marcus reading. But first, I'd like to introduce you to Catherine Segerson, who's going to announce the winner of this year's Morton Marcus Poetry Prize. And um, so I'll let her do that intro and reveal to you who the winner is. But I just wanna start by saying a few words about Catherine. As editor-in-chief of Catamaran, Catherine Segerson runs one of, one of, if not the most beautiful literary journal in the country. And I don't say that lightly. There are so many gorgeous journals out there, but I'm not afraid to say that Catamaran is really up there in terms of its art and layout and how that is married with the writing in each issue. Just a gorgeous journal. She's also run an annual film festival and a yearly writers conference under the auspices of Catamaran, bringing esteemed writers from around the globe to convene in Pebble Beach every summer. And it's a gorgeous um, conference and space if you're ever interested in looking into attending there. She has been an asset to the local writing scene and we're thrilled to have her and Catamaran host this annual prize. We're also glad that she can be here tonight to tell you who the winner is and to introduce the winner herself. So please welcome Catherine Sagerson. <laughs> Hello. Thank you, Danusha, um, for that introduction. The Morton Marcus Poetry Contest uh, was originally 
founded by Jory Post in 2013. And beginning this year, it's going to be under my direction and facilitated by Catamaran's nonprofit organization. This year's judge for the poetry contest, the Morton Marcus Poetry Contest was David Sullivan. And David is a poet faculty member at Cabrillo and he is the current poet laureate of Santa Cruz County. The winning poet receives a check for $1,000 for a single poem and the prize is generously funded by our family properties. This was a blind contest and the names were hidden for all the submissions. The winner, which was selected by the judge is Alison Luderman for her poem, Season of the Sonnets. And um, let me tell you a little bit about Alison. Alison Luderman is a poet, playwright, lyricist and teacher living in Oakland, California. She has published four books of poetry, the most recent of which is In the Time of Great Fires. She also writes personal essays and has published an ebook called Feral City. And you can order Alison Luderman's book. Um, there's a link here um, in the Time of Great Fires. And Alison Luderman is here with me. And so I would like to present Alison with a check for a thousand dollars for her poem. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and invite Allison to read to you her winning poem. So please welcome to the screen, Allison Luderman. Thank you so much, Catherine and um, Danusha and all the people involved in this um, wonderful contest and in this reading. I'm really honored to be here and to be with you all. So this is my poem, it's called Season of the Sonnets. For six months, I lived inside of them. Stray lines floated up when I rose early to catch the bus, to catch the train, to catch the other bus that took me to my job. Like as the waves make toward the pebbled shore, or when I lugged clothes to the laundromat, that time of year thou mayest in me behold, or walked with my backpack through the snow down to bread and circus to load up on sunflower seeds and yogurt, when yellow leaves or few or none do hang. All those weeks and months in my drab costume of broke 20 something substitute teacher, a girl who cut her own hair in the bathroom mirror and all the while his words were glints of gold in my mind stream. Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? Five nights a week, I climbed winding stairs of an old church in the back bay to arrive finally at the topmost attic under the eaves where along with a dozen others, our brave band of players, we dive into the sonnets make them come alive like little plays, which is what they are, glistening, empty fishing nets cast nightly into the ocean of the infinite. And we left everything else at the door, illness, bad bosses, divorce, because theater is a temple and you don't enter a temple with shit on your shoes. So we'd sweat through our workout, then turn to the poems, those little songs, vowels and consonants and diphthongs, dulcet syllables sliding over lips, teeth, palate, and tongue, till we broke each word down to its essence of sound, speaking gibberish, singing the sweet debate, parry and thrust, marry or die, marry and die and live forever in language. All that March and April, I'd walk over the Mass Ave bridge from Cambridge into Boston to save the 50 cent bus fare, looking down at the Charles River where Harvard students sculled privilege gilding their shapely muscles. And his lines would float up, consumed with that which it was nourished by enchanted melancholy season when I had no boyfriend and Shakespeare was my lover. No stable work, but Shakespeare was my job. 
I loved him the way a Christian loves Jesus, and I never lost my religion. As decades later, I find one or two, or sometimes a whole glittering seam of his words still shining in my rock-strewn mind, compressed to diamonds by the weight of love and time. Thank you so much, Allison. What a beautiful poem, compressed to diamonds by the weight of love and time. I always think as a poet, you aspire to writing just a few lines that someone might get as a tattoo. And I'm not, I'm not saying I would necessarily, well, but I'm thinking about this. I'm thinking about the poetic tattoo, um, but those are definitely lines I would consider. So beautiful lines. Um, so thank you again. Thank you, Catherine. And thank you, Allison, for reading your poem. And before we move on to our headliner, um, I just want to mention the passing of Jury Post. And if you have been someone who's attended this event year after year, um, you're used to seeing Jory's face on the stage, Jory introducing the winning poet um, as part of Frenzy, the organization that he ran and founded. And so just want to take a moment to bring Jory into the space and honor all the women um, on this committee and also as part of our Santa Cruz community. As a poet himself, as a writer, and as somebody who's been very much a part of this event. So thinking of you, Jory, and just wanted to say your name tonight and make sure that we were taking that moment to remember you in this place now. So thank you everybody. And now we get to move along to talking about Gary and hearing him read some of his work. It is very much my honor and pleasure to get to introduce Gary. And I'm gonna start with some of the facts as we do. And then I will lapse into the other bit where I get to introduce you a bit, Gary. Good to see you there in your room of books. So I will begin by saying that Gary has been a long-term faculty member here at UC Santa Cruz, um, teaching you know, in, in the literature department and I guess creative writing part of the literature department and also has run the Cowell Press and is doing both of those things in the manner that he does things. A, a la extraordinaire. Not, that didn't make sense quite, but <laughs> close enough. Doing them. I'll take extraordinaire. That works for me. Oh, you take extraordinaire? Oh, this is so fun that we get to banter. I feel okay. Whew, this, I'm, not, I'm not so alone. <laughs> you are not alone. Gary has also received a push. It's, but I'm talking about you. So just, you know, I'm going to talk about you while you're here. He has received a pushcart prize, the Shelley Memorial Award from the Poetry Society of America, and grants from the National Endowment for the Humanities and the California Arts Council. He was also the very first Poet Laureate of Santa Cruz County back in 2010 and kicked off that whole program for us here. But I wanna really talk about the poems. So I get to do that for a little bit, Gary, and embarrass you possibly <laughs> while you're here. But how to talk about Gary Young and his linguistic sleight of hand. There are poets you can teach panning the waters of their poems for the gold of craft in the hope of discovering technique to use and to pass along. And there are poets who defy such gleanings. Lucille Clifton is one such poet. You can turn the nugget of her poem around and around in your hand, but not be any closer to replicating its magic. It seems to have arrived from elsewhere, and the doors to that elsewhere are not visible to the naked eye. Gary Young, too, employs an unseen methodology. Again and again, I arrive at the end of one of his poems startled, shaken awake, in the way that a poem in its most condensed and potent form can do. In that moment, it seems, the poem is able to reveal something long hidden 
but also intimately known. In a recent conversation I had with the poet Jane Hirschfield, she referred to this revealed information as mineral knowledges. I love the plural here as it accommodates the multiplicity of such knowledge as do Young's poems. While seeming to take place in the landscape of the ordinary, whether the grocery store or the forest, these poems pull back the veil and reveal a hidden wor world. In the words of Hamlet, there are more things in heaven and earth, Horatio, that are dreamt of in your, or in this case, our philosophy. In one poem, moths appear and vanish in a shaft of light, having found perhaps a way to travel between worlds. In another, a boy wanders into the woods and is found by the dream dreamt by his neighbor. Mystery and ordinariness live side by side. Young's poems can also be read as homeopathic preparations for death small and precise. They remind us of our mortality while at the same time reminding us how to live. How do we let go of the world while simultaneously allowing ourselves to be cradled by it? Let us take, for example, the ubiquitous mushroom scattered throughout these poems. I thought you would like that. <laughs> the mushroom in itself can appear as a symbol of life's constant, unexpected renewal, appearing suddenly, for example, after rain. It can also be the possibility of a meal sautéed with garlic and butter and eaten by candlelight while stranded at home by a storm. But then again, it might be the vessel that carries your consciousness to an expanded elsewhere, otherwise hidden in the middle of right here. To see, for example, the bright plumed serpent god waiting for you by the side of the road. But then again, the mushroom could be the bringer of a certain end, appearing in one poem as the brassy helmets of the dead. There it is that other possible fruit of paradise, or is it Hades? These poems don't try to carve the line that separates one from the other, life from death, the ordinary from the extraordinary. They allow us instead the privilege of the present tense, a moment, a meal, one more finite breath. So with that, I'd like you to join me in welcoming Gary Young. Thank you so much, Tanusha, for that exquisite introduction, as we were saying before. <laughs> uh, uh, I'm so happy to be here. Uh, I'd like to thank you too, Allison, for your wonderful poem and congratulations again on your prize. I'd also like to thank the Morton Marcus Reading Committee and my good friends at the Humanities Institute and the Literature Department at UCSC. And I want to thank all of you for being here. Uh, and especially I'd like to thank my students. After meeting on Zoom for a year and a half, we are back in the classroom at last, though fully masked. Um, and though this platform doesn't allow me to see you, it's nice to be seen. Uh, so we're halfway there. Uh, so this is me unmasked. I'd like to imagine that my students are thinking he's much better looking than I thought he'd be. Uh, but more likely they're thinking he's a lot older than I thought he was. In any case, it's very good to be with you. I'm going to start with a few poems um, from my latest book, That's What I Thought. And then I'll read some older work and if I manage the clock effectively, I'll finish with some poems from the book I'm working on now. The first two poems I'm going to read were written in Japan while I was working on a book of translations there. At 60, 
I've made progress eliminating anger from my heart and ridding myself of attachment to things. I have freed my mind of troubling thoughts and foolish distractions, but I cannot seem to cure myself of lust. I suffer every affection, pleasant colors, smooth skin, soothing voice. To tame these passions, a sutra suggests that we meditate on the body's impurities, feces, urine, smeared blood, scorched bones, or imagine being devoured by wild animals. I've tried. It may well be that a living body is like a rotten corpse, neither one worthy of desire, but how could I ever turn away from my son's dark eyes or the music of my boy's sweet voice when he calls to me? And I feel I must confess uh, that this poem was elided a bit before it was published. Uh, my wife was originally mentioned in this poem and after reading the poem, uh, she said, no, no, no. Um, she has the final word on such things. All that's left of the fabled residence is a tea house on a tiny island in the center of a pond. The great hall must have been beautiful. The little house and the bridge beside it are lovely even now. Wisteria sways along a trellis that rises from the pond and three turtles rest on a rock beside a slender crane. The water is marked with the dark shadows of cedar and pine and enormous carp circle the pond endlessly without knowing they're in a pond, without knowing that they're carp. There are those damn mushrooms again. Um, I had to laugh at Danusha because uh, our friend Stephen Kessler, uh, a wonderful poet, said so after this last book, Gary, let's hold off on the po on the mushrooms for a while because uh, I have to admit, I uh, I live in the woods. I'm in Bonnie Dune up in the Santa Cruz Mountains and uh, winter is all about mushrooms. So uh, here's a mushroom poem. Sorry, Stephen, but I, I, I can't help myself. In the woods, hunting mushrooms, I saw a, fa a flash of white and thought Amanita, death cap, but it was just a piece of paper. When I picked it up, I recognized my own handwriting. It was a note I must have written months before and dropped. Waterlogged and half eaten by slugs, the ink was faded, but I could read, the willingness to use our minds is what erodes our minds. I was born during the Korean War. Uh, I came of age during the Vietnam War. And like everyone else in this country, we've been dealing with endless wars since Panama, Grenada, Iraq, Afghanistan, and so many other small conflicts in between. But my, my father, um, his war was World War II. And looking back uh, on the street where I grew up, it was a typical suburban middle-class neighborhood, a lot of kids. Most of the fathers uh, had seen combat. And in retrospect, I realized that they were all suffering from PTSD to uh, varying degrees. Uh, so I, I wanted to write a poem about them. And that's, this is what this poem addresses, uh, the neighborhood dads. We grew up hearing war stories. The man next door 
came to beside his downed plane and discovered someone cutting off his finger for his ring. In the backyard, we shot the pistol he'd taken from an Italian officer. My father hunted men in the caves of Okinawa. His friend found the skull of a Japanese soldier there, polished it to a bright sheen, and sent it home to his father. Down the block, a neighbor gave his son a handful of photographs, women playing with their breasts, a man entering a woman from behind, a group of soldiers standing in a circle around someone with a sword. Such extravagant, incomprehensible gifts. The women, the gun, a man kneeling beside his own head, which had fallen a short distance from his body. There's another poem about my father, or at least my father's um, death. A robin calls out from the redwoods. Siskins chatter at the feeder and doves coo side by side on the roof. An eagle drifts overhead, shrieking like a lost child. A house finch runs his scales and a chickadee repeats chickadee, chickadee. How strange, my father, who could not imagine a world in which he didn't exist, is dead, and the birds keep singing. No one would have been more shocked than my father. So I've been a fossil hunter all my life. As a boy, I was a baby paleontologist. Uh, I still hunt for fossils when I get a chance. Uh, you may even see I've got a mastodon tooth over there and a mammoth tooth and a bunch of dinosaur teeth. Uh, my oldest son, Jake, he's got dibs on, on the mastodon tooth. Uh, so my youngest son, Cooper, he put his, uh, his tag on uh, a whale's tooth and that's what this poem is about. The whale's tooth was etched with a needle or a fine blade to pass the time on a long voyage. On one side, a woman sits bare-chested, a cloth draped over her lap, her body disproportioned, the execution awkward. On the other, a three-masted whaler in full sail is depicted in stunning detail, the proportions perfect, the masts and rigging rendered with passion and precision. The sailor had seen more ships than naked women, or perhaps his drawings betrayed his truest affections. The woman was a gauzy memory, an invention, but the ship was at hand. My brother, Brian, has always been more adventurous than I am. Uh, when he was much younger, he went down to Mexico and overstayed his visa by several months. Um, I met up with him in southern Me Mexico, where he showed me the sights. I waited 40 years to, to write this poem. I just didn't know quite how to get into it. Um, I think I finally got it. In Chiapas, at the entrance to a meditation chamber near the great pyramid of Palenque, my brother showed me the stone carving of a Mayan priest holding a mushroom, then opened a bag filled with mushrooms soaked in honey and said, help yourself. We followed a wide stream to a waterfall and I swam to a rock in the middle of a pool below the falling water. A thousand chirping birds sang in a single voice. A butterfly landed on my shoulder, then another, until my body was covered with them. I felt as if I'd blossomed. That morning, 
a woman in the marketplace had given me a small bird carved out of jade and said, you will need this. I held the bird before me like a divining rod and followed it out of the jungle. The sun set and in the darkness, fireflies tore holes in the night's fabric, bursts of light from the world behind this one. My brother found a car with keys in the ignition and we drove down a narrow dirt track. We didn't get far. Up ahead, the serpent god stood on the side of the road. Bright plumes adorned his head and spilled over his shoulders. He wore a cape made of hummingbird feathers and carried a stone sword that rested against a belt heavy with human skulls. My brother began to pull the car over, but I turned and said, don't pick him up. And I can guarantee that my brother would have picked him up. So I just turned 70 and uh, besides thinking of death constantly, I'm always worried about losing it up here. Um, and I don't think there's anybody who's my age or older, certainly, who doesn't, uh, when they can't remember a, a date or, you know, where did I put my coffee cup? They think, oh my God, that's it. I'm starting to lose it. It's, uh, this is the end. Uh, This is a poem about that fear. I was looking for a word, but I couldn't find it. I struggled for that word, but it wouldn't come. On a train from Penn Station to Springfield, Massachusetts, I once met a charming, beautiful girl. She mesmerized me, and she told me her name, but it's gone now. Everything seems to be slipping away. I once had a friend from Serbia or Azerbaijan, I can't remember which. Scaffolding, apostrophe, cosseted. I lost those words, but they came back to me. If I lost them for good, how would I know? I like to think that my boys would tell me Dad, you've lost it. Um, so I'm going to read some older poems now and uh, read from my new and selected, uh, or selections from eight of my books in here. And uh, I'm going to read uh, poems from my first book of prose poems. Uh, it's called Days. Uh, and the first time I had cancer, my surgeon sat me down and began to tell me just what he was going to do, what was going to happen. And he went on and on and on. And finally, I asked him, how much are you going to cut out? And he said, I'm going to cut out as much as I can without killing you, which was clear enough. And when I started writing my first book of prose poems, Days, I employed a similar method. I made a list of the poems I wanted to write. And I wrote a page and a half or two pages for every poem on a big yellow pad. And then I started to reduce them to eliminate everything I could without killing the poem. They ended up very short, one-lined poems that move horizontally across the page until they end. She took my two hands in hers pressed and caressed them as if she were bathing me. I held hers as mine were held, stroked her knuckles, her palms, then realized the finger I lightly traced was my own. How strange to find I could show myself such tenderness. Our son was born under a full moon. That night I walked through the orchard and the orchard was changed as I was. 
There were blossoms on the fruit trees, more white blossoms on the dogwood, and the tiny clinched fists of bracken shimmered silver. My shadow fell beside the shadow of the trees like a luster on the grass, and wherever I looked, there was light. This is the poem that, that uh, Mark Ong put on his gorgeous poster that he designed for this reading. Two girls were struck by lightning at the harbor mouth. An orange flame lifted them up and laid them down again. Their thin suits had been melted away. It's a miracle they survived. It's a miracle they were ever born at all. This is a poem about my oldest son, who's now 33. Um, I should have known, and maybe I did, um, as early as uh, the events in this poem, that he was going to be a, a writer. And that's, he just published his third book of poems a couple of days ago. Uh, the world is made of names. My son is learning to speak. He has faith. He believes in things. Rock, I tell him, leaf. Know this, he says, holding the rock. This, he says, holding up the leaf. I put asters in a small blue vase. Each morning they open and they smile again each night. Even in this dark room, they follow a light which does not reach them. They have bodies. That is all the faith they need. The second book in, in the trilogy, No Other Life, is a, a book called Braver Deeds. And uh, it's one of my favorite books, but it's about violence, about physical violence, emotional violence, racial violence, political violence, sexual violence. And it's a book about my mother uh, who had a, an appetite for violence. I usually don't read from it, but I'll read one or two. Um, in case, unless I'm running out of time and I wanna make sure I get to read some of the newer poems. Um, crushed by love and by a war that wouldn't end, I abandoned God in 1968. I thought God had abandoned us all. The world might still exist if I could hold it in my mind, but there were people all around me whose lives were more desperate and more wonderful than anything I could imagine. There is an emptiness so great, not even the suffering of others can fill it. God is the chance that anything can happen. Then it happens. This will drive my wife crazy. She hates it when I'm flipping around looking for poems. But the one thing about, about my poems not having any, uh, any titles, uh, they're difficult to find sometimes. Um, I have always been fascinated with uh, spontaneous human combustion. And I have uh, quite an extensive uh, library on the subject. My favorite book about uh, human, spontaneous human combustion was written by uh, the world's authority. His name was Bob Arnold. The book is called A Blaze and I have it signed and he, he, he wrote to me, he says, stay cool, which I thought was very cool. The bodies of men and women sometimes ignite from within and burn 
from the inside out. Nothing remains but a pile of ash where only minutes before a girl had been lying on the beach or a young man had complained of the heat and then burst into flame. How can we explain the world? My heart is beating. I can feel it. God loves us more than we can stand. So this is a, a poem about the worst thing that ever happened to me. And I don't know why that makes me want to laugh, but it sort of does. Um, maybe because it happened when I was five years old and um, I certainly suffered um, since I was five, but this is the worst thing that ever happened to me. When I was five, I knew God had made the world and everything in it. I knew God loved me, and I knew the dead were in heaven with God always. I had a sweater. I draped it on a fence, and when I turned to pick it up a minute later, it was gone. That was the first time I had lost anything I really loved. I walked in circles too frightened to cry, looking for it until dark. I knew my sweater was not in heaven, but if it could disappear, just vanish without reason, then I could disappear, and God might lose me, no matter how good I was, no matter how much I was loved. The buttons on my sweater were translucent, a shimmering pale opalescence. It was yellow. While I was writing uh, the books uh, in the trilogy, uh, I gave myself a, a carrot sort of on a stick. I was going to write a book about pleasure. And I told myself that when I was finished, I would write a book about, about pleasure. And in my mind, it was going to be a racy catalog of prurient adventures. But when I finally got around to writing it, it was mostly a about food and children, um, and I guess I just waited too long to read it, or to write it, rather. Oh, I think I, I, I can't read another, another mushroom poem. Stephen would go crazy. I'll read a poem about Stephen instead. This is Stephen Kessler. Um, Stephen sends me clippings from the Times. Joe Black, a pitcher for the Dodgers, is dead. The poet, Philip Whalen, is dead. A Buddhist Lama, dead for 80 years, sits in a full lotus dressed in a golden robe, his radiant skin still pliant. In Montana, a desperate man feeds a boy to his neighbors. In the New Square Fish Market, a 20-pound carp shouts apocalyptic warnings in Hebrew. We can't resist, and though we spend our whole lives trying, we can never touch all there is. So I wrote a, uh, read a little poem about my, my oldest son. Uh, I wanted to read a, a poem about my youngest son, Cooper. Um, so Jake became a, a poet. Cooper became a mathematician, although he already has a book of poems out, so go figure. Uh, this is a poem about uh, Cooper when he was a child. Um, I don't think I'm, I'm telling stories out of school to say that uh, he was a handful. Uh, he was one of those kids where you go, holy smokes. Um, he was a real handful. One day I took him to the circus. 
Acrobats vanished behind a veil of thick blue smoke. Jugglers tossed hatchets and knives, but it was hot. My son was restless, and we wandered out to the deserted midway. My son ran between the empty amusements like while a loudspeaker blared, come see the world's smallest horse. I could hear the animal whinny from its stall while the disembodied voice called, come on over, come on in. This is something that you'll never see again. My son pushed his way through the padlocked gate and was too excited to answer when I called him back, or perhaps he couldn't hear me over the tape's continuous loop, crying, he's alive, he's alive, he's alive. I'll say. My friend Brad Crenshaw is a poet and a neuropsychologist, and he introduced me to uh, a fellow who landed in his hospital. I felt a kinship with him as soon as I heard his story. In Western Massachusetts, a man wandered into the woods to live alone. He tried hunting, but the only animals that stood their ground the only animals he could catch were skunks. The man was sprayed, of course, but he caught them, ate them, and dressed in a cloak of rancid pelts. When he was found, the scent was on his breath, his skin, and when I heard his story, I thought, comrade. I'm looking at my watch here. I, th I think I've got a few more minutes. I'm going to read a few poems from um, my work in, work in progress. Uh, American Analex is the name of the book, taken, of course, from uh, the Analex of Confucius. And in that work, Confucius writes a lot about the imperative rulers, the importance of rights and good conduct. But what I really love most about his book is when he exalts his friends and his disciples. Uh, my book revolves around some of the people that I've lost, and in particular, my friend and mentor, Gene Holton. He was an artist, and he was my ideal reader. Uh, if Gene liked what I'd written, then I was satisfied. My youngest son considers the effect of imaginary numbers on imaginary numbers. His brother ponders the duality of abstraction and specificity, while I wrestle with the concept of essential nature. We are pilgrims. The branch of a willow bounces off its reflection on the surface of a canal. Mallards bob in a murky pond. A crow tears at the body of a mouse on the gray tile roof of a temple. All you poets out there, I'm sure, will um, identify with this next poem. Last night I fell asleep, and in a dream I wrote a poem. I worked every line into place, and when I'd finished, I woke up, scribbled the poem down in the dark, and went back to sleep. In the morning, I picked up the notepad beside my bed, expecting to find the poem, but there was only a single word printed there snow. The authentic self is inarticulate, and there is no end to the excitement of failure. This morning, I was playing poker in a dream and a nuthatch sitting next to me said, this game's too rich for my blood, and flew away. Then I woke and heard the dawn chorus, every bird in the canyon trilling and chirping at once. 
I used to believe their songs meant, here I am. Now I think they're saying, where am I? Perhaps I'm projecting too much. Each night, an owl cries out from the redwoods. He calls, and I call back. I call, and he answers. We share the same bright moon, the same shadows, and the same fate. The possibility of discussion is limitless. We have no secrets. This morning, I discovered an owl pellet by the front door, a wad of fur, and a jumble of femurs and little ribs, oracle bones, easy to decipher. I'll finish with two poems uh, about Jean. Each moment blossoms, stutters, and takes its place in the past. Bees sip water from the moss at the edge of a pond. Scarlet oaks tremble in a breeze. Night falls. I held Jean's hand while he was dying. He fell asleep and when he woke, his mouth tightened and he started to cry. He didn't cry because he was dying. He cried because I was there and I would have to watch him die. Outside, the sea was going up in flames. Jean believed that there's virtue in being incidental and embracing the achieved accident of who you are. I'm not so sure. Fruit ripening on the branches of the apricot and plum promise sweetness, and it's easy to forget that within each tender fruit, there's a stone at its core. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's been an honor, and I look forward to taking some of your questions. Gary, thank you so much for that reading. I was so worried that um, people could hear me laughing from behind the veil. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that's possible. <laughs> so here I am laughing on screen. No, but it's just so many beautiful moments and funny moments in there. As always, thank you so much. Well, and there you. are questions for you. Oh, excellent. There are. We're just making you wear all these different hats here tonight. Um, I like the first one. It's kind of random. So I'm going to throw it at you. What is your favorite word in any language? Breakfast. I love, <laughs> breakfast. I love the word breakfast. I'm breaking my fast. I'm going to eat. Love breakfast. <laughs> okay, that's that's a very good answer. Breakfast. I had a little friend who pronounced it prefix. Oh. And by little, I mean like four. And so I, that has not worn off. I can't stop saying it prefix. What's for prefix? Um, so that's maybe kind of my favorite. Okay, Jennifer wants to know, could you tell us about the translation project you were working on in Japan? How did it come about? And what was it like to translate? I was offered the chance to translate the calligraphy of uh, Koban Chino Aragawa Roshi, who was a Zen master and uh, was uh, one of the main people at the uh, San Francisco Zen Center at Tassajara. He started um, many uh, different temples around the world in Tucson, I believe, and in Germany. And uh, my friend Hollis Delancey uh, said, would you like to translate his calligraphy and design a book? I was just going to do a, a, a book, letterpress book of his calligraphy. And then I had a chance, uh, the good folks at the Chikochi Temple wanted to send me to Japan to, to work on translations. And, and I went and, and spent a month um, staying with scholars in, and, uh, in monasteries and uh, completed that and that's that's how that came about and it fell into it in a yeah. way yeah yeah 
Like so many of the best things, I always want to tell young people, don't you? Most of the things that happen that you, that are amazing in your life, you didn't cause them exactly. Just sort of in the right place, the right time. And you can't anticipate them. That's the whole point. Yeah. You, you can't keep moving, you know, a little bit like a shark. Something is going to show up that's going to look tasty. <laughs> so much like a shark. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so Sri Priya wants to know, and I think this has to be asked, why do you find mushrooms fascinating? They pop out of the ground or out of dead trees. I mean, you know, they essentially they grow on dead things. And so they're, they're, they're living, but they're living at the expense of what is rotting. Um, and they taste good and some can kill you. So there's an element of danger in them and, and, uh, and myth and fairy tales. You know, the witches were putting mushrooms into their pot. Um, yeah. A little it, bit it, of magic, a little bit of danger, a little bit yeah. of death. Yeah, exactly. And desire and pleasure, right? Because they're, they're delicious. Yes, all mixed together. Yeah. Okay. I like that. Well, that, oh, that's a great answer. I thought, how, how can we answer that? Cause it's hard to know why the things fascinate us that do, but that's, that's a solid answer. It's all the things in one. Um, there's a bunch of poem uh, questions here about the poem. So let me see what else. Um, I'll go with Jordan's. Is there any one poet you would say had the greatest The greatest, I'm sorry, you cut out for just a second. Oh, I did? Okay. Any one poet you would say had the greatest impact on you? Starting off, uh, it would be Stephen Crane. Oh. Uh, I fell in love with Stephen Crane. Uh, I, I bought a copy of Witter Binner's translations of uh, the Tong Dynasty poets. Jade Mountain, and I fell in love with the Tang Dynasty poets, and um, that book made me want to be a poet. And in fact, I have a book of translations from the ancient Chinese coming out next year. Uh, but I read the Red Badge of Courage, and it blew my mind. And so I read everything of of his and his his poems. Uh, you know, the, and they're little gnomic poems with no titles. That was certainly an influence on my move to remove titles from my poems. Um, mm -hmm. Think as you, as I think, said a man, or you are abominable, you are wicked, you are a toad. And I thought a moment and I said, I will then be a toad. How can you not like that? <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. Could clap no. death in the tree. Uh, you know, he's... Yeah, I, I, I could recite a lot of Stephen Crane's poems, but I won't because that'll cut into our discussion time. Into our time here. But about how old were you when that happened, when you fell it down that well and thought, oh, I, I love this? Because falling in love with Tang Dynasty poets is, I mean, I'm in that, trying to imagine an age range where that would happen. Over 13. Pretty young. Yeah, that was in junior high school. Yeah. Was that, it, I, I bought the books and I bought Immortal Poems of the English Language uh, the anthology, Oscar Williams, about those two books. I have no idea why. Um, and those two books really charted my life. Um, who knew? Why, why I couldn't have picked up a copy of Think and Grow Rich or um, <laughs> How to Influence People. Uh, but no, instead I, I got those. And the rest is history. Such is our lot, Gary. Such yeah. is so our be careful. Lot. <laughs> books are dangerous no matter what they say. <laughs> that's right be careful what you pick up especially at an impressionable age yeah be careful what you put in your mind yeah, yeah that's the truth um mika wants to know can you talk about the role of teaching in your life gosh it's my whole life for the last 25 years um i've been teaching uh, at a high school and at the university uh, for 25 years. And uh, that's pretty much what my 
my my life revolves around my writing uh, i take notes all the time i carry a notebook as i insist that my students do and so i'm always taking notes but i don't write except for the summer months because i'm too focused on my teaching i'm too focused on my students work um and i'm fine with that uh, i've still managed to publish a lot of books probably more than anyone ever needs to read um maybe uh, when i was younger i'm i was i'm lucky uh i made my living as a visual artist and a poet until i was almost 50. wow in my late 40s um and so i think if i had been teaching uh, as much as i am now when i was younger i would have resented it um yeah coming to teaching later and i had taught various places as a visiting professor and whatnot um but doing it pretty full time um you know it, it keeps poetry alive for me too mm -hmm. i love working my students poems uh, i love it when the, i can see the light bulbs go off and and they make their own poems better so uh yeah it's you know it's a bit of a of a drug you get addicted to it it's a rush. <laughs> I love that, the teaching itself. Yeah, it keeps it alive because you're always around people to whom the information or the poems are totally new, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's exciting. Um, so, okay, somebody is asking here. Well, someone, Jane is saying, Jane Eng is saying, Gary, we love you and we're laughing out loud Danusha <laughs> and we see the abundance oh the question moved around uh we see the abundance of books in your library what subjects do you like reading about I guess subjects meaning things other than than poetry I'm imagining well let's see this, this is only half my library well half the books are down at the house um and you can only see half of my library so there's books 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 um everything in the back there is philosophy i read a lot of philosophy um i sorry fiction writers i don't read a lot of fiction anymore although i certainly have um but i read a lot of poetry i, I read a lot of uh, more history and a lot of politics lately the political situation is has been so dire the last few years i find that i'm reading um a lot more political works than probably I should. Um, it's like it's like reading reading political um, books is is a little bit like um, reading, you know, the uh, medical journals and you start thinking, oh, I think I might have that. It's like, oh, my God. Oh, look at that rash. Um, I Oh, is that what that is? And <laughs> but I, right now I can't help it. But and I tend to go and and you know there's different times I will focus on different things. So um, you know there's there's a whole section just on on uh, Chinese and Japanese poetry and philosophy. Um, I've, I've been reading many different um, translations of the Analects because I love them and I'm writing a book that is um at least in my heart based on on confucius so uh, so it just depends on my mood and and what i happen to be focused in at the time and yeah. sometimes i will go crazy and read all the novels by one person every on a bender a novel bender yeah i get that too just no novels no novels and then oh i have to read everything this person ever wrote well, that's what happens. Uh, yeah. You, you find a book, you go, oh, this is incredible. And then, of course, you want to read their other work. All of it. Yeah. So is that your next project or your current, this one that relates to Confucius? Yes. American Analects. That's the the, okay. the book. The, the poems I read at, at the very end, those are from those the are book from I'm there. working on now. Oh, great. OK, glad we got a preview. Um, oh, there's so many questions in this Q&A, but I'm, I think it'll give us maybe a couple more. And then um, something like that, someone can let me know if there's a timestamp that I should be aware of, because we've got 15 questions still in here. Um, <laughs> someone is appreciating your line, eating a mushroom is like kissing a dead person on the mouth. 
<laughs> I just had to put that in the room <laughs> since we were talking about death and desire and mushrooms. So that's, <laughs> that's, that's a hell of a line. Maybe that's also a tattooable line since I'm <laughs> looking for poetry lines we can get as tattoos. Okay. Um, Melissa is asking or saying, I love these poems, Gary, and your reading. Can you say something about the difference between the poems in No Other Life and your current work? If you see a big difference, I guess, just however you want to answer that. There, there is a, a difference. Um, and, and No Other Life is, there is three books and days very much focused on the birth of my first son and it's all about light and the i wanted to write a book about my mother but i didn't have the chops i wasn't a good enough writer so i knew i had to figure out a way to write about my mother and so i wrote days and that's when i started writing these prose poems and that gave me you know the tools i needed to write about my mother and that's braver deeds and that's a the book that's all about violence um and that's just a dark book and then the third book if he had uh, the third book in the trilogy is is more of a gray book and so there was a big trajectory and you know it took me a dozen years to write those three books um and what i'm focused on more now is um well it's more getting ready to leave if that makes sense um yeah about uh you know what's important what's not important anymore um and uh and looking at that and and again exalting in my friends and and a lot of poems about about friends who have died and yeah. wanting to memorialize them that shift i was thinking about that how many of the poems that you read tonight even are about lost things, lost words and phrases, or the birds saying, where am I? <laughs> Instead of, you know, I'm here. And how do you, I don't quite know how to ask it, but I guess I had a question around how your thinking around the relationship of the poems and loss or losses, the process of writing or however you want to take that. I think every poem is an elegy uh even poems about about pleasure and about love that moment that you are writing about is gone it's over mm -hmm. um i mean that's that's what the lyric poem tries to do is to stop time to capture it um and it's a conceit because you can't there it goes Shit. um oh here it is again present oh now it's gone and so in our poems we are always um writing an elegy for what has been hmm. and so uh i don't think i'm obsessed with death or with loss but i just think that that's the human condition as i see it i love that answer every poem is an elegy i remember um a poet saying when i was in my formative study years that every poem is a love poem in some way. Now I have those two in my mind. You know, every poem is a love poem, every poem is an elegy. And I love how those are both true. A love poem to what's already gone often. So thank you for that. I think we're now at that moment where um, that was, we had 15 minutes and that went so fast of Q&A. And I just want to remind people that the links for Gary's books, as well as for Allison's book, um, are in the chat. So if you are interested, and I'm sure you are, in knowing how to order those books from a local bookseller from Bookshop Santa Cruz, please refer to the links in the chat. They're right in there. And it's a free event, but go ahead and buy books. That's a great way always to support poetry and poets and in this case bookshop santa cruz so that's um good on all of those fronts so we hope that you'll do that and if you already have these books get more because you can give them as gifts it's that time of year and i think we don't always think about what it can be to give someone a gift of a book of poems but i know that's the kind of thing i really love to receive and for those who are less entrenched in the world of poetry um 
It's nice to have someone curate that for you, to have a friend give you a book that they love. So just putting that out there as well. And um, also, we're hoping that you'll check out the interview that Maggie Paul did with Gary Young that's coming out in the next issue of Catamaran. So the winter issue of Catamaran will have that interview in it. And those interviews are always really fantastic. That's another tradition and part of this reading series. And you get to find out more about the poet and what inspires them. All of Gary's secrets, I'm sure. Fashion tips, all kinds of things. <laughs> They're all in there. It's, it's all in there. Trust us, it's all in there. So please check that out as well. And we're just really grateful to the Humanities Institute for helping this happen and to all of our sponsors. Yes, amen to that. Amen to that, right? All the work that goes on behind the scenes that helps this happen. So we're really grateful that we're able to continue and we've had such a fabulous turnout tonight. Thank you for being with us at the 12th annual. Morton Marcus reading. And thank you so much, Gary, for your humor and presence and poems. Thank you, Danusha. And thank you everyone for coming tonight. Thank you so much. Bye for now. Bye -bye. Till next year, we hope. Hope to see you again and in person. Fingers oh, crossed. Wouldn't that be nice? Wouldn't that be, nice? Oh. be really nice. So good night, everyone. Good night, everyone. <laughs>